a funny thing happened to me on the air. My third week on the radio. And now I'm loving it, man. I can't wait to get on. And the general manager called me and he said, Al Fox, the all night disc jockey, is sick. Would you mind working all night tonight? I said, sure. I'd have worked 24 hours a day just to talk into that microphone. So I'm playing records all night. There's no one there in the station. And the phone rings about three in the morning. And I pick up the phone, it's at WHR, and I hear this woman's voice. And all she said was, I want you. I want you. Now, I'm a Jewish kid from Brooklyn. No one has ever said that to me. I want you. And I suddenly realized there were some other advantages to being in this business. So I said to her, I get off at six. And she said, uh, I have to go to work at six. I said, well, what? She says, come over now. I said, I'm on the air. She said, here's my address. It's 10 blocks away. Figure out a way. Now, I'm faced with my first moral dilemma. <laughs> I've been only on the air three weeks, but no woman has ever called to say she wanted me. So here's what the radio audience heard. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just sitting in for tonight, so I have a special treat in store for you. You're gonna hear the entire Harry Belafonte at Carnegie Hall album, uninterrupted. I put the record on, I had 23 minutes. I, I, which, by the way, is all I need today. Anyway, I, I gun to her house, pull into the driveway, there's the Volkswagen, her Volkswagen, light on over the door, I open the door. There was this lady in the negligee, blonde hair, the radio's on, Harry singing. She opens up her arms, I rush into her arms, and I hear Harry say, down the way where the nights, where the nights, where the nights. <laughs> the record's stuck. I place her gently back, run out to my car, Jewish masochism, I keep the radio on, driving back to the station where I'm hearing, where the nights, where the nights, where the nights. <laughs> I get to the station, I'm picking up the phone, I'm apologizing. And the last call was obviously an older Jewish person. Because I said, you know, WHR, and I hear this voice go, there the nights, there the nights, there the nights. I'm going crazy with there the nights. I said, oh, I apologize, why didn't you change the station? And he said, I'm an invalid. And the radio is on top of the bureau. And the lady who takes care of me, she sets the radio at your station. And I listen all night. I can't get up to change it. So I've been listening to Veda Nights for 20 minutes. My little adventures in early radio, but I didn't lose my job. Hey, welcome right to the show. Thank you, group. What a, what a handsome group. There you go. We do our best. We do our best. Well, where do you gather them from, Nick? Well, you know, they come from all across the world. We just cherry pick them from Facebook usually, so. Go ahead, Nick. Fire away. All right, let's do this. Everyone wants to know when they meet someone who's accomplished the kinds of things you have in your life. You know, where did they come from? Do they eat radioactive cornflakes? Tell me about where you came from. I was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1933, the beginning of the Depression, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's first year. I had a brother who had passed away, who was six years old. He died from a bad poison that ruptured his appendix. It came in peanuts. So I had a father and a mother, and I had a tragic circumstance. When I was nine and a half, my father passed away of a sudden heart attack. He came from Europe, and he was a very proud American. He tried to enlist in World War II, and they didn't take him because he was over 40. So he, uh, he went to work in the defense plant to build ships to help America. He was that kind of guy. And he just died suddenly while at work. And that changed my life. I was a bookworm, I skipped third grade. I lost interest in school. I never thought when I was a kid that I would have had the career I've had. I just wanted to be on the radio. I can't explain that. But when I was five years old, I would imitate 
radio announcers. I would listen to the radio and then run into another room and imitate what they had just said. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. When I was a teenager, I would visit radio shows that had studio audiences. And I would watch men and women stand by microphones and read copy, soap operas, whatever I could see. I was just enamored of the whole world of communications. I never wanted to be anything else. I never wanted to do anything else. We hear sound originating at that very moment, hundreds or even thousands of miles away. I thought I'd be a Dodger announcer. The chips are down at Ebbets Field. Race up, fifth inning, Yanks ahead, two to one. The Dodgers shortstop laces one. I worship Red Barber, and he was the Dodger announcer. And I, I would imitate him. I would listen to Dodger. I would go to Ebbets Field where the Dodgers played. I go up to the back row, roll up a scorecard, and broadcast the game to myself. Boom! Mantle belts it over the fence in right field. When I went to ball games, other kids wanted autographs. I never wanted autographs. I'd wait after the game and ask questions. Running down the street with players going to get their car. Why'd you do this? Why'd you bunt? What happened in the third inning? I remember that. They used to call me, you know, uh, Zeke the Creek the Mouthpiece. My name was Zyger, so my nickname was Zeke. I wasn't a good student. So I lost interest in school. I just got fantastically interested in sports, movies. I was enraptured with anything entertaining, anything in communications. So, so your dad just, I mean, he goes to work and, and, and passes away and you guys are left to you and your mom and your brother. Uh, I mean, walk me through maybe why you feel like you lost interest in, in school at that point. It was a very difficult time. I got mad at my father. I didn't understand death. And he left. I didn't, I was nine and a half. I didn't know what life, death, who died, you know? And uh, I was uh, significantly mad at him. He was a Yankee fan, I was gonna be a Yankee fan, I became a Dodger fan. I did not go to the funeral. And what added pressure to it is that my relatives, my aunts and uncles, Jewish families, you know, you're the head of the family now. What? You are the head of the family. You have to take care of your mother and your brother. You are the responsible person in the house. What are you giving me this? We were on relief. We tell you about relief. New York City paid our rent, gave my mother, I think our rent was $40 a month, lived in an attic apartment, and gave my mother some money for food and so because she couldn't work. An inspector would come by every once in a while. You didn't know when he was coming. He would look in the refrigerator. My, my mother would buy top grade meat. And he would say, you don't have to buy top grade meat. You could buy choice or chuck. And she said, no, for my boys. Yeah, but you have to eat too. And she wasn't, you know, I don't have to eat. You know, but that's the way she was. And when that inspector would come, that was really, nobody likes being on relief. He wanted to get out of it. There was a lot going on, obviously, through those years, too, with the military. I understand you, did you try to join the military? What are you, out of your mind? <laughs> I'm a Jewish kid in Brooklyn, tried to go to the military. I was drafted, this is a funny story. I'm drafted into the Korean War, 1951. The height of the Korean War. April 22, 1951. The Chinese were to make one more real try. I was classified 1A, that means physically fit. I'm drafted. My friends gave me a party. My mother's crying. I go down, I'm afraid. And they're starting the physical. And they said, all guys with eyeglasses go last, so you don't hold up the line. So I wait and go last. I take my glasses off, they got the chart. I can't see the chart. They measure the glasses, and then they're ready to be inducted. Raise your right hand to be sworn in. And as he's reading the induction, the guy yells, Zyger, come here. I walk over and he says, go home. Go home? Your eyes are 230 over 500. My left eye says, you, you're like blind. I says, I can't believe this. He says, listen, 
If we took you into the service and you were in war, if you lose your glasses, shoot everything. <laughs> shoot our guys, shoot everything, because you can't see it then. I had to go home. My mother was thrilled, so I never served in the military. So what happened next? You, you thought you had it planned out for you. What, did you. what kind of jobs, what did you do next? Oh, I had every job in the world. I worked at Hearn's department store. I worked for United Parcel Service. I sold Borden's milk on the phone. At Hearn's department store, they put me in charge of collections. We had to collect money for people who were delinquent, so I invented a word. And the word I invented was congeliate. And we would send out a letter to people, if you do not pay by next week, we will congeliate your account. <laughs> and then the second letter went, we're gonna send it over to the sheriff for congeliation. I remember one day a guy came running in with a check. Don't congeliate me. I don't know what you're talking about. I, I, I just was not a good worker. I would, if there was a dare, I'd get off the subway and not go to work. I was just, I was just meandering until radio. Until that day, that first day, changed my life, changed my whole attitude, changed everything about it, from no, no ambition to total ambition. And I got a break, I was walking down the street, and a friend introduced me to James Sermons, who was director of announcers at CBS. Here's really big television news. You're the first to hear all about all new 1952 life-tested television. And I said, I'd like to get into radio. I'm 22 years old. He said, go down to Miami. It's a big market, a lot of stations, no union. And they're either young guys on the way up or older guys who've been announcers and just taking odd jobs. And I was lucky that my uncle lived in Miami. He had an apartment. I could stay with him. I went down to Miami with $14. The first thing I saw were two water fountains, and one said colored and one said white. I'd never seen that. So I drank from the colored water fountain. I was a rebel. It tasted good. Then I get on a bus to go over to Miami Beach. And I'm sitting in the back of the bus and the bus driver stops the bus and says, move up front, you're white. The back is for Negroes. So I didn't know what to say and I said, my father's a Negro. I prefer to sit in the back. Then I got over to the beach, had a little apartment, I knocked on doors, went to one station, small station, WAHR, did a voice test. I'd never spoken in front of a microphone. I read the news. And he says, I like your voice. We have a lot of turnover here. And the next opening, you could be a disc jockey. I hung around the station, just watching. I'd hang around all day and then go to my uncle's house. And then one day, the general manager called me in on a Friday. And he said, uh, Tom Bear, the morning disc jockey, he's on from 9 to 12, is leaving. So you start Monday morning. Whoa. You have your own show from 9 to 12 playing records. You're going to make $55 a week. In the afternoon, you'll do sports and news. I went out of my mind. I'm gonna be on the radio. That whole weekend, I didn't sleep. I picked out records I was gonna play. I was practicing what I was gonna say. And then it's the morning of the big day, May 1st, 1957, my first day on the air. I am so high, it's un I'm just jumping. And the general manager calls me into his office. This is your first day, good luck. I said, thank you. And he said, what name are you going to use? I said, Larry Zyger, you can't use Zyger. It's too ethnic. People won't know how to spell it. You need another name. I said, well, what are you? And he had the Miami Herald open. I would later write a column for the Miami. And it was an ad for King's Wholesale Liquors. He said, how about Larry King? OK, you're Larry King. I later, a year later, I legally changed it. Now I go into the studio, I got my records picked. It's nine o'clock, biggest thrill, turn on the mic, lower the record, nothing comes out. Nothing. I bring the record back up, I turn it down, nothing comes out. The general manager kicks open the door to the control room, and he said, this is a communications business, damn it, communicate. And he shut the door. I turn the record down, turn the mic on, and I swear to this Nick, I said, good morning, 
My name is Larry King. That's the first time I've ever said that, because I've just been given my name. And this is my first day on the air, and I've wanted this all my life, and I've been scared. I've been nervous. I was thinking I'm going to blow a career on my first day, so I'm going to try to do my best. And I learned something that day which 61 years later still works. The only secret is there's no secret. Be honest. Be yourself. So I was always myself. I never thought about a question I'm going to ask. I went to the moment. I go to the moment. Nothing would happen that would throw me. If a fire broke out in the studio, I would broadcast the fire. I was never nervous again, ever. You start getting on the air uh, from 9 to 12. How did you get the nickname Mr. Miami? There was a restaurant called Pumpernick's, very popular 24-hour restaurant in Miami Beach. And their slow time was 10 to 11 in the morning. And by that time, I had now done the morning show. So he said, if you could do the show from 10 to 11 and you finish at 9, drive up and do an hour of interviewing people. I never interviewed anyone. So I did this show at Pumpernick's. They had me in the window. People came in from all walks of life. I'd interview waiters. And then one day, Bobby Darren walked in. And then Danny Thomas, Jimmy Hoffa. The Teamsters had a convention across the street. Here I am, I'm 23 years old, interviewing Jimmy Hoffa. And then it started a parade. Famous people started coming. And Muhammad Ali, when he won the Olympic championship, he was Cassius Clay. He came and did an hour with me at Pumpernick's. The Miami Herald wrote a big write-up on me. Channel 10 called, gave me a television show. I was in a world. It was mad, Captain. Miami was a great scene. Tell me about, everything was going great in Miami, but you got in some financial trouble. Tell me that story. You know, Miami is a wide open town. And I, I would live high, you know. I mean, I never drank, but I liked to go to the racetrack. I liked to pick up dinner checks. You know, big man, small town make 70,000, spend 100. I didn't think about it. I was forced into bankruptcy, and one station let me go, and I, I was out of work for about six months. I happen to believe that our form of government is strong enough to survive the truth. And I believe that people of America want to know the entire truth about how their president was shot down in the streets of Dallas. And I want to assure you that as long as I am alive, no one is going to stop me from seeing that you obtain the full truth. You, you met up with a guy named Lou Wolfson. I don't, most people wouldn't know that name, but tell us about him and what happened there. He was a great trader, and we knew, we both of us knew, Jim Garrison. I, I interviewed Jim Garrison, the district attorney in New Orleans, who was investigating the murder of John Kennedy. And Jim Garrison and I had dinner, and Lou Wolfson was a big financier, and he wanted to meet Jim Garrison. And Garrison was raising money for the prosecution of the guy in New Orleans who he had accused. They made a movie about it called JFK. And Garrison and I were friendly, and we had dinner one night with Lou Wilson and the district attorney of Miami. And Lou said, I'll be happy to help you. I'll give you $5,000 a month, and I'll pass it through Larry and Dick. So on the third month, he gave me the 5000 I couldn't reach Garrison. He was in trial. I couldn't reach him. I had a tax bill. So I used the 5000 to pay the tax bill. And I figured the next time I make a little money, I'll give him the 5000 In the meantime, Lou got out of jail. Where was the 5000 He accused me of stealing the 5000 I didn't steal it. I borrowed it. So I, you know, I was arrested, and they threw the case out. I've had ups and downs. Life hasn't been easy. But I tell you, when I look back, Paul Newman told me once, anybody successful doesn't use the word luck as a liar. 
luck. Was I, wasn't I lucky to walk on the street in New York that day and meet that guy? What if I, what if I just stayed one second more? I wouldn't have met him. Would I have had the same life? You never know. Profound. So, you, so this thing happens with Lou Wolfson, and, and you get arrested, but he gets dropped. Does, does the radio station totally cool with that? Is it what happens? The radio station let me go. But I got hired back. Television station let me go. I went to a news station. My guest is an extraordinary Miamian, Dr. Jacques Fresco. Everything bounced back. Got a new column, Miami Herald. I got the Miami News. In other words, I don't explain it. And then, four years later. The Mutual Radio Network decides they want to do a coast-to-coast -coast talk show all night long. There was no coast-to-coast -coast talk show. And the guy who ran the network liked me. So he hired me to do midnight to five, five nights a week. Moved me to Washington. I got a television job in Washington on a local station. Still wrote my column for the Miami News. And was on the air with 32 stations. In 1978, when I dropped that show in 1996, I had 530 stations. And we paved the way for all these talk stations now that are everywhere. We were the first. And then in 1985, CNN came along. Ted Turner had been on my radio show. And he said, you know, I own CNN. I said, I know. I didn't see it because they weren't on in Washington. He said, well, we're going to be five years old. I got this lady doing a show, and Sandy Freeman, she's okay, but her husband's her manager, and he bugs me. Ted's that way, he bugs me. He's coming in Friday to sign a new contract. This was Tuesday. I want you to do that show. You're listening to The Larry King Show. I was making 200000 on the radio. He said, I'll double, I'll give you 200000 do 9 to 10. And I said, but then I can't go to my Oriole baseball games, can't go to hockey. I got to do 9 to 10 and midnight to 5. Into the zone, good drop off for Holt, back to Gustafson, shot to go! I'm convinced it's not the world's best thing for your health, and that it has to take, so there have been studies done that the all-night worker lives about a year less than the regular population. Your body metabolism is operating off different things. See, most people get up and go to work. I get up and don't go to work. The last thing I do every day is go to work. So Larry King Live was born June 1st, 1985, the fifth anniversary of CNN, in a little studio in Georgetown. It was raining. Mario Cuomo, the governor of New York, was my first guest. And I knew 10 minutes into that show, I was going to make it. Just felt right. Our first guest tonight is an old friend. We know each other 25 years from back in the days in Miami Beach. Don Rickles. It's, Don, you look so serious. What, what is this? <laughs> oh, because I, I can't believe I'm on such a stiff show. Listen, <laughs> Larry, you said I was successful. I tell you the truth, Larry. <laughs> you weren't exactly skyrocketing to fame at that time. You were on a barge. That's about right, 30 I'm... miles out in the middle of the water saying, come on the show and we'll talk. But it's good to see you again. Am I right? Are you getting gray? Yes, Larry, I'm getting older. <laughs> Doing shows like this. <laughs> what? Midnight to 5 a.m. What? That doesn't sound like popular hours. Tell me about oh, that. We had some great callers. People were smart. We used to do a show twice a year called Why Are You Up? It came from all over the country. No calls were screened. Cincinnati. Las Vegas, Iowa. This is the Larry King Show in Washington. We'll be back with your phone calls for... Phones were always lit up. Unbelievable people came on our show. Bill Clinton called them when he was governor of Arkansas. I said, Governor, what are you doing up at 3 in the morning? He said, don't ask. <laughs> I think we know what he was doing. One night, true story, a guy calls in. All I knew was the city. The engineer told me the city. I didn't know what the question would be. I said, Salt Lake City, Utah, you're on the air. This guy's whispering, Larry, Larry, I love your show. I said, thank you, why are you whispering? I'm a thief. <laughs> you're a what? I'm, yeah, I'm a thief. I'm in this house. I want to make sure everyone's asleep. I'm under the couch downstairs, and I'm going to unlock the safe. And I'm listening to you in my ear, because 
a thief is a lonely job. <laughs> and he said, you don't know how many thieves listen to you. <laughs> I'm popular with thieves. And we called the, same, the Salt Lake City Police and there was a home break-in. Here's Larry with John Dean, Birmingham, Alabama. Hello. People could call in on any subject, baseball, politics, anything, and I would wing it all night with them. And we just sit there, I looked out on the nation's capital, all these lights flashing like you're king of the world. I'm doing television every weekend on CNN, and I'm sitting here with these radio lights. But when I was living up, incredible. I just loved it. I soaked it in. I know there's some really memorable stories. I was over 25 years at CNN. I mean, from, I mean, tell us about 9-11, tell the OJ case. I mean, tell us about some of those things. The OJ trial was unbelievable. We covered it every day. That's how I moved to LA. That's how I met my wife, was the OJ trial. Okay, I'm gonna have to interrupt this call. I understand we, we're gonna go to a live picture in Los Angeles. Police believe that, that OJ Simpson is in that car. Okay, we're gonna do that. I swear to you, I'll give you what I'll you, give you me, I'll give you my whole body. I, okay. I just need to get to my house. Okay. okay. I'm gonna live with the cold. I'm just gonna leave. I'm no, just gonna don't. go in the cold. That's all I'm gonna do. That's all hey, I'm listen. trying to do. Think about everybody I else, can't all right? I do it on a freeway. I couldn't do it in a field. I want to do it at a grave. I want to do it in my house. You're not gonna do anything. Too many people love you. Your uh, kids, your mother, your friends, AC, everybody. You got the whole world. Don't throw it away. Uh -uh. Don't throw it away, man. Come on. OJ? Hello. Austin again. Tom, uh, your purpose there was to stop a suicide, right? Yeah, Larry, what's important to remember here, at the, at the time we hooked up with him, this ceased to be a murder investigation. Now we had to consider that this was a man who had obviously been accused of a very brutal double murder. I was in Washington. I didn't know L.A. very well. They gave me a map, and I broadcast for two and a half consecutive hours following that car. The California Highway Patrol has another helicopter. Could be a police helicopter. is trailing it. They're going south through Orange County. I would have to run to the bathroom and again, be honest. I said to the audience, I got to run to the bathroom. Just keep watching the chase. I'll be right back. And I followed the cars right up to the arrest. Just, just, just toss a gun. All right, who is that out there? I just toss it, Jess. He's just trying to help. Phil Van Adder, from listening to that, does that sound like to you a man who did it? Well, I think, I think the responses were very, very strange for an innocent man. That whole trial was insane. I knew so many people involved. I knew the lawyers. I got to know the prosecutors. I got to know everybody involved with that trial. And then one day, Judge Ito invited me to come to his chambers. I'm sitting there, he's showing us all the letters he's getting. I said, you know, Judge, there's a trial on. And he says, hey, I'm the judge. I'll decide when to go back. He's the judge. I'm walking out, and instead of making a right, I make a left, and I'm in the courtroom. And as soon as that door would open, that's where the judge came in, the cameras would go on because they were covering it 24 hours. Now I'm standing in the courtroom, and OJ yells out, Larry, in the courtroom. I go, Juice! I know him very well. It was insane. That whole trial was insane. And I will reveal here something I have not revealed. I dated Joel and Demetrius, who was the jury consultant for OJ. She helped pick the jury. And I dated the other girl, who was the PR director of the prosecutor. I was dating them both at the same time. I would send messages to OJ. I would have lunch with one and dinner with the other. I was living a revolving door. I was in the middle of that case. All right, Mr. Car Mr. Uh, Simpson, would you please stand and face the jury? The day of the verdict, I'll never forget. Mrs. Robertson. 
Superior Court of California, County of Los Angeles, in the matter of the people of the state of California versus Orenthal James Simpson, case number BA097211. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant Orenthal James Simpson not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187A, a felony upon Nicole Brown Simpson, a human being, as charged in count one of the information. I'm staying at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. I was with Sid Young and Wendy, my producer. Looking out the window, the streets were bare. A verdict had come in. After all that time, over a year and a half, and all those, and all the, and a verdict was in, and not guilty. And the next night, I had Johnny Cochran on my show. He will be making a statement. I gather he's going to come forward in some, some forum. I think he will be soon. Nobody, none of the lawyers even, knew the facts as well as O.J. Simpson. And at 10 to 7, O.J. calls in. O.J. calls into the show. Please understand that we will be going a little over because with us on the phone now is O.J. Simpson. Uh, how are you? I'm doing fine. And uh, one, I want to thank you, um, a lot, you know, a lot because so many of my friends have told me that you've been fair in uh, in hosting your show and bringing uh, the points of view from both sides. I want to thank Mr. Calhoun for taking the time out of his life. Uh, I know it had to be tough for him. And most of all, I want to thank that man, <laughs> Mr. Johnny Cochran, for believing from the beginning, listening and putting his heart and soul on the line uh, to, to send me home and spend time that I'm spending right now with my kids. And he's complimenting Johnny Cochran. I'm interviewing him. I'm trying to make more conversation. Now it's 7 o'clock. I'm supposed to be off the air. But I got OJ on the phone the night after the trial. They call up the control room from Atlanta and they say to the producer, get off the air. We have a special, a tape documentary on OJ. And he said, hey, you got a tape documentary? We got him on the phone live the night after the trial. That's, that's the workings of television. Get off the air. We kept him on. I've never talked to OJ since. We had, that message was left on your answering machine? Yes, it was. Yeah. What does he do, uh, Laura? He works for Cantor Fitzgerald, and uh, he's a bond broker. Um, and he, he was on the 102nd floor, and he left a message, and uh, that's the last, the last I heard from him. Well, Laura, what must it be like to hear that? It, w it was just horrible. It was really just horrible. I could hear the terror in his voice. And he was trying to sound like he was calm for us, but you could hear the, the chaos in the background and the terror in his voice. Tonight, aftermath of the unthinkable. Americans struggle to count the terrible cost of what the president calls acts of war and contemplate what comes next. 9-11 was unbelievable. I was on the air for 75 straight nights. Good evening, I'm Larry King, and this is a special edition of Larry King Live. Firefighter James Grillo of the New York City Fire Department, as you can see, some injuries suffered. He was in the South Tower when it went down and lost several of his firefighter friends. Mr. Grillo, James, what was it like when you got there? It was terror, Compl sheer terror. Bodies were falling out of the sky. They were jumping off the 105th floor, and they were landing all over the street and the sidewalk. There was fear in everybody's eyes. You also saw people jumping out of buildings, right? Yes, they were jumping out from everywhere from the uh, 70th floor above. It was horrible. Uh, two weeks later, I was at ground zero. The fire chief took me around all the rubble. How do your men and women handle finding body parts and all that? I mean, how do they... Believe it or not, they're very happy to find them. You know, they everybody's resolved to the fact that we're not going to rescue any of our guys. There's, there's always that, 
that dream that there's some something that's going to happen. But I think they're resolved to that. But they're happy now. We've gotten to the point, and we can't believe it, that we feel good if we tell a wife that we found remains of her husband. I mean, that's, that's the, it was the worst time to broadcast and the best time. To, by best, I mean you're in the middle of the greatest story ever to hit America. And you're there asking about it. And you gotta have emotions, talking to people, firemen crying. It's hard, man. You get a kid like this, he's in your second year? Yeah. His second year on the job, you know? It took me 31 years to see something like this. Not aware of it. Put Vicks vapor rub on the nose. There's still like six, over 5,000 bodies still there. And we haven't found them. That's how much stuff it is. And you can smell. You can smell it, yes. That's why they give us this. They give us the uh, the Vicks. Put it under the nose. So we can, uh, it'll take away from the stench. That's a day that we'll never forget. Everyone will remember where they were. It was, that was, that was a rough time. Three straight pro games against potential playoff teams, but now they're back at home. They've been one of the best home teams in the league. Five from one record at home, pure domination. I'm taking the Vikings. They blow out the Bengals 27 6 in Minnesota. The Bengals are a mess. They're playing out the stretch. I don't know. If you had the longest running show in history at CNN. What, at what point did you, did you decide, ah, this is not for me anymore? Well, at the end of it, 25 years, long time, made a lot of money. Made a lot of friends. Beautiful house in Beverly Hills. Ted Turner had left. Time Warner was gotten huge. And I was getting along real well. I had always had three year contracts, four year contracts. And one day they called me and they said, uh, your contract's coming up in about six months and we're offering you a one year contract. Well, that was seven years ago. I was 70 six years old, a one-year contract. I'm still good, I'm still alive, I'm still fine. So I said, I, the writing is on the wall. So they said, you can make your own announcement your own way. Uh, it's, it's not very often in my life I've been without words, but I want to thank everybody associated with this program, all the people behind the scenes, as I mentioned, Wendy and the staff, the floor people, Everybody who makes it possible, even the suits at the top. I love them too. Uh, when I started 25 years ago at a little studio in, in, in Washington, D.C., I never thought it would ever last this long or come to this. So I'm going to go on, do a lot of other things. We're going to do specials here on CNN. I'm going to be seen in other places. We'll do some radio work. Be around baseball. So you're not going to see me go away. But you're not going to see me here on this set anymore. For two weeks, they're going to be playing highlight shows. I, I, am, I don't know what to say except to you, my audience. Thank you. And instead of goodbye, how about so long? didn't accept the one-year contract. I left, they were very nice. They gave me a very nice pay for a year. And quickly thereafter, Carlos Slim, the Mexican billionaire, called me up. I had spoken for him at one of his charities. And he said, you can't, you can't retire. Let's do something. And I was home, and when Obama announced that Bin Laden was killed, I got up off the chair, ready to go to CNN get on here because that's what would have happened if I was still working and there was nowhere to go it was a Sunday night and I said to myself you know I really miss this so I called Carlos back and said let's do something he financed Aura TV which I've been doing now for in my sixth year so I've never stopped. Welcome to Larry King Now, today's show. A man who needs little introduction. In fact, he is the, my oldest friend from Miami of 57 years, Don Rickles, Mr. Warmth. 
You may know him as a Hollywood treasure, the godfather of insult comedy. He skewered the likes of Reagan and Sinatra and Johnny Carson, and yes, me too. He, why do you never, why didn't you just retire? Why do you holler at me? What? <laughs> <laughs> We're not in a big hall. We're in a Mickey Mouse apartment here. <laughs> What? Well, I don't want to retire. It keeps the mind going. Like you, you're not retiring, and you've been asked to. <laughs> but with me, the, the mind, you know, the mind, like the wife says, you've got to keep the mind going. And I had this, uh, the, on the series, I had this leg problem. You know, it started out as a little nothing. And it became, I can't even pronounce it. If What's it, your, you have a disease? Yeah. Hey. <laughs> Do you have a disease? No, when, <laughs> no it's, not, it's, not, it's a thing, that get, it's a poison that gets into your leg. I don't know how I got it. And uh, they came and the doctor said, we got to operate. I had seven operations. Wow. Yeah. So you can't stalk the stage anymore like you used to? You, well, I you will were eventually. I'm not finished. I'm not going to go in a wheelchair and, and spit up on myself. No. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, eventually I'll get rid of the cane and it's like a... But in the meantime... In the meantime, I told Johnny Depp, if God forbid who's a friend, if they take the leg off, I'm not un unhappy, because I know I'll be able to do a pirate movie. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, so thanks. <laughs> I make a ton of money, he's gotta tell me I'm funny. <laughs> you, so, you don't... so okay, in closing, you're certainly not done yet. What do you see next? What are you excited about? Next? Yeah. I'm 83. Next. One, I hope I wake up. Uh, next. In my head. Nick, I'm still a little Jewish kid from Brooklyn. Where did all this go to? What do I want to do when I grow up? I, I still feel like that kid on the street who bumped into the head of CBS. I've had so much happen to me. I got married seven times. This current marriage has been 20 years, which is unbelievable. I mean, I have two teenage boys and three grown children. When people see my wife and I together, you know, the obvious age difference. They look at me, they look at her. I know what they're thinking. And I always say the same thing. If she dies, she dies. <laughs> so I'm the bionic man. And as I said to my wife, I would like to be frozen. I don't believe there's an afterlife. I don't, I don't, I lost my religion a long time ago. So I'd like to be frozen. And then whenever I die, they'll cure someday and they'll revive me. And my wife said, but you won't know anybody. I said, I'll make new friends. <laughs>
It doesn't matter how many times you marry. This is the last time. If this goes in the toilet, don't call us. There's no more gifts.